Kanye Omari West was born June 8, 1977, in a small suburb right outside Atlanta. He was born after many torturous hours of natural childbirth uh, that eventually ended in a cesarean. Guy had a big hit. Kanye is an only child. His name was taken from a book of African names. Kanye means the only one. The name that we gave him was very appropriate. He is the only one. When Kanye was born, I was working at Morris Brown College and I was chair of the English department. Ray was working as a photographer at that time. He was an award-winning photojournalist and just a brilliant photographer. From the time Kanye was born, his dad was really actively involved. I was the one taking care of my son initially because his mother went back to work. He got up in the middle of the night and he couldn't really feed him because I breastfed. But as far as changing diapers and that kind of thing, no problem. He never was one of those kinds of dads who was hands off. We were very close, very close. <laughs> Kanye always was quite a character. Lots of energy, quick, endearing smile. You clearly could see a certain confidence with himself. He wasn't the greatest at playing with others because he always had to be the leader. He always wanted things to go his way. He always seemed to have a mind of his own. You could definitely see part of his dad and part of his mom in him. They always had strong opinions and strong views on, on everything. We grew up very aware of racism in this country. And I was even arrested at the tender age of six for sitting in, demonstrating at a lunch counter in Oklahoma City. I came from a military family. By the time I got to college, I joined the Black Panther Party. We say power to the people! The political activity was all about making sure that whatever was not just became just. Kanye's mom and dad played a huge role in molding Kanye. Kanye's dad, I think, is a great person, but we just didn't have the kind of personalities that would mesh for the long haul. I had ideas about things I wanted to do and wanted to accomplish. I lost touch with what was important. Kanye's father and I separated when he was only 11 months, and at three years old, we divorced. His mother stayed in the area for a while, and then she uh, took a position at Chicago State. We packed everything up, and then I got Kanye, and the two of us drove from Atlanta to Chicago. My Uncle Ray, his father, remained in Atlanta. Kanye had regular contact with his father uh, by telephone frequently, and he began to go stay with his father every summer. She put him on a plane, and I'd gather him at the, uh, at the airport. I'm not sure how tough it was for her. I know it was very tough for me. Kanye and I moved to the south side of Chicago. He went to school out of the neighborhood. It was a magnet school, humanities, and the arts. Only those that applied and were accepted were actually at that school. He was always into any type of art. He just loved to create. He was really very much gifted in visual arts. And even at three years old, he could draw uh, better than most kids, two or three times his age. Initially, he wanted to design sneakers, and he wanted to do animation. My little case of art supplies was like a treasure chest for him. But to get into that and just to draw for hours. He started writing around his mother, because his mother was the wordsmith. First, he'd write things in his mind. And then when he got to the point where he could actually physically put the pen to the paper, he did a few poems as well. It was his own interpretation of reality. When Kanye was 10 years old, 
We spent one year in、uh, the People's Republic of China. Our university had an exchange arrangement with Nanjing University. His mother said to me, "Here's his chance to experience other cultures." He took private art lessons there. He took Tai Chi there. He mingled with people from all cultures. He traveled a lot. Kanye's mom wanted him to be well-rounded as a child and experience different things. From the time we hit China till the time we left, we were both stared at. The Kanye was really stared at all the time. These people had really not seen a black kid. People would want to see him break dance. They'd look at Kanye and say, "Break dance, break dance, break dance." And he just decided to make it a win-win. Okay, I'll break dance for you. You pay me. Kanye always knew that he had a gift, and everybody should look at him, and everybody should see what he's doing. We came back the end of August in 1988. It was fifth grade. Kanye walked into my classroom and walked up to me and told me that he wanted to be on a talent show. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the Quad. The name of the group was the Quadro Posse. Stepping was the craze at the time, so he and three other friends、uh, got together. He was like flipping people over, and sweep your leg, they jump up and all that. And at the end, it was pandemonium. The Quadro Posse. They won the talent show. He's always been a ham, not a shy bone in his body. Music was the medium of communication of this time for young African Americans. Hip hop was getting strong. Kanye was about 12 years old when he got his first keyboard. Well, he immediately started producing with it. Kanye sat down and he told us he wanted to be a music producer slash rapper. A lot of times you would see him off to himself in his own world. Sometimes trying to learn something new or trying to create something. He was focused. When I say focused, I mean I mean focused. The next summer is when he said that I'm, I want to stay here in Chicago this summer. I think it was a surprise to Ray. It was more important to him to stay in Chicago and work on his music. You know how kids get their own agenda, and Kanye's clearly was music. Kanye spent the summers with his father until he was 15 years old. And then just decided he would devote full time every minute that he had to producing music. He was really focused on on making music and perfecting his craft, and I didn't see him much after that point. Kanye went to Polaris High School. It's definitely like a kind of college preppy high school. Yeah, he was like one of those kids that was a good student, but. He he didn't apply himself to be a great student. What kept him in school was gym, lunch, and art. Kanye was a very talented artist, and he loved competition. And so he entered many competitions. He won twice for the Axel Award, sponsored by the NAACP. He did some paintings, some drawings that were astounding. He was expressing himself in art. However, he was focused on on making music. He had a studio set up in his room with the keyboard and the speakers, a couple thousands of records just lined up against the wall, a bed, a couple crates. The room was packed with his equipment. There was just enough room left for his bed. He was a person that just always liked good music. We are listening to like Counting Crows. Head, Natalie and Brewer. He's trying to get inspiration from whatever he can get it from. He actually started putting beats together and experimenting with different types of music and recording. After a while, he started selling his product. Fifty dollars a beat. 
maybe sometimes 100, and then maybe if he's lucky, 250. The word around town was that you can get this little high school dude who had beats for $50, 100 bucks. When I met Kanye, he was producing a group called State of Mind. He realized that, you know, his talent was maybe in producing as much, if not more so, than in rapping. He started telling them how to rap, telling them how to, you know, have a swagger. He was a phenomenal producer. But Kanye needed somebody to take him to the next step. And that's when No ID came along. No ID say, ah. At that time, No ID was like the king of production in Chicago. And he was doing Common and Syndicate and all these groups. He provided Chicago with the first sound that was like progressive hip hop and soulful. No ID is the son of very good friends of mine. So when Kanye learned that, he went crazy. Oh my God, Mom, I want to meet No ID. When I met Kanye, he really didn't have any experience with making music on a, a real level. He just had a computer and a vision that he wanted to be a star. Kanye sleeping out in no ID's driveway, waiting for him to come home. He was like past his 15, 16 years old, trying to hang around a grown man. If he didn't even have the drive that he had, I probably wouldn't have helped him as much, but he wouldn't ever take no. Kanye's interaction with No ID definitely stepped his game up as a producer. No ID taught Kanye a lot. He taught him a lot as far as making beats, as far as programming and all that. But Kanye wanted to be a rapper. He knew a lot of other people that rapped, so he started a group called The Go-Getters. Kanye West, he is them guys. Aerostar, he is them guys. It was Aerostar. Really dope. Timmy G, GLC, and Kanye West. 87 niggas is them guys. Go-Getters. Young, ambitious guys trying to hide something. He started going out performing at hip hop clubs. He would say, Mom, I gotta go because they're gonna have these talent scouts. I would go along because here he is, not yet 18. The Dragon Room was our best spot. We would go there on Sunday nights. The Go Getters opened up for me at a couple shows at uh, Banana Joe's. These guys were on stage and they were rapping their heart out, singing their hearts out, doing the moves, everything. <laughs> We thought we was on top of the world. Kanye graduated from high school in 1995. Kanye went to the American Academy of Arts. As it turns out, he didn't want art, so he transferred. After that, he went to Chicago State because his mom was the professor there. Kanye's been all this time in the music studio. <laughs> he liked his music class. That's the only class that he cared about, nothing else. And we'd be up to like six in the morning working on music. This is like, this is what we want to do. Kanye kept hustling. Whatever he could do to keep his dream going. Yeah. John Monopoly was the hot new guy on the party scene. Yeah. So Kanye being a businessman said, hey, why don't you manage me? I was managing his rap group for him and doing parties and concerts, and we were trying to get our thing popping. Yeah. So we decided to invest some money into this record. A song called Oh, Oh. oh, 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 oh. So they hit us off with the Oh, Oh, oh joint, and they're like, we need you to like bang this in the clubs and bang it on the radio and, and just blow it up. We had like flyers and picket signs. Like we had picket signs outside of the radio station, like play to go get us. People were like, oh my God, they're picketing WGCI. Like there was no way that the station was going to put this song in the rotation because there was so much music from everybody that was like really hot at the time. Even though it wasn't on the playlist, they would went against their boss like, we have to do this. So I'd hit the song like, okay, tonight's Chicago Home Jam is Kanye West and the Go-Getters. Oh, 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 oh. We had the song of the summer for the Midwest on WGCI. It was big working the record and then having a record breakthrough because from Chicago at the time, there weren't that many artists that were getting 
spins. So like, you know, Kanye built up his buzz. But no ID exposed Kanye to the industry. The first major beat that he did was on Jermaine Dupri, Life in 1472. Jermaine Dupri was huge at this time. I was working on my album. I had Mace, I had a little bit of everybody, Jay-Z, everybody, Lil' Kim, Slick Rick, Snoop, Bone Thug and Harmony. He made a beat. The single was called Turn It Out. Thick and thin from beginning to the end. Never do I lose. All I do is win. When he sold his first beat to Jermaine Dupri, and he got $5,000. And he was living with his mama. We weren't used to having no money. I was like, you got $5,000. And he with Jermaine Dupri. It was just amazing, man. Nobody kind of suspected it. Nobody kind of saw it coming. Kanye had his first major placement. Southtown made it down here, boy. Somebody from the crib made it down here, boy. Selling that beat led to a meeting with Columbia. He was really proud. He believed so much that he was going to get a record deal. He dropped out of school. No fallback plan. His mother being a professor, she was devastated for him to drop out of school. He had the Muhammad Ali mentality that I'm the greatest. Kanye was invited to go to New York. He gets flown out to Columbia Records. He meets with the executive, Michael Malden. We had the deal. Everything was ready to go. But he went in there and acted like, oh, I'm going to be better than Jermaine Dupri. I'm going to sell more records than he would ever sell. And they weren't ready for that. The person that he was talking about was Michael's son, and he didn't know it. Michael Malden was sitting there like, oh, this dude is... Talking about my side. They gave him the three words. We'll call you. Kanye pulled up in a limousine and rode away in a taxi. <laughs> he was just feeling like, damn, what did I do? Kanye never heard back from Columbia after that. Kanye, I thought he was going to go out to New York and, you know, come back being a big rap star, but it didn't work out. After Columbia Records didn't sign him, he came back to Chicago. He was, like, disappointed and hurt when it, when it didn't go through for him. Being real close to the dream, and it shot us apart. I remember him saying, man, what's wrong? I said, you think you're there? It's not there yet. At that point, he knew that he had to consider drastic measures. He wasn't going to lay around the house. He got out to his dream. You didn't even see Kanye in Chicago. He didn't even come to clubs no more. Kanye didn't go to parties. All he did was sit in his room making beats. He began to really step it up. He ain't taking no showers, no haircut, no new shoes, nothing. He's just in front of that keyboard every day. He never stopped working. By this time, he had moved his tracks up to between 500 and 1,500 a track. He's just producing here and there for people who've gotten small deals. He was doing a lot of ghost production, meaning you do the beat, but you give it to a big name producer, and he puts out the beats. Other well, people was taking the credit for the things he was doing. It just felt a little frustrating. He was just sick and tired of things not working in Chicago. He's out here in the suburbs of Chicago, all the rap acts in L.A. or in New York. He wanted to get his music out there more, so he decided to move to Newark, New Jersey. His first apartment was about 20 minutes away from New York. We rented the apartment sight unseen. He left everything behind and just started off fresh. That was the biggest risk he ever took, but that was the best thing for him to do. He paid a couple months rent and set up shop and just got to hustling. Non-stop, day in, day out. In that first month, he sold maybe like 30 beats. The real, real. time, hip-hop and I were working at Rockefeller Records. We were the heads of the A&R department there. And we were trying to find more of a sound. We were trying to create the next hip-hop Motown. Our aim was to have two to three producers in our whole company to really start the movement. And Kanye 
Kanye was like one of the first ones that popped up. Official coming from the QB. Hip Hop and G, he brought them in and they played all the songs and talked to him and they found out that this guy is really a genius. The dream genius. They were starting to shop his music um, inside the Rockefeller system. He had sold beats to uh, like Beanie Siegel. He did the truth. Every time I step in the booth, I speak the truth. Y'all know what I'm bringing to you. I bring the truth. Once he was in the inner circle, coming by every day, playing joints every day, had access to the studio 24-7, he was in. He would just start coming around and getting familiar with the other artists. And people, you know, came to know that he had just great beats. <laughs> One day, Kanye was like, yo, I got these beats. I'm going to come, come by the studio and give you the beats. So when he came by, Jay happened to be there. I was working on a Blueprint album at that time. Jay-Z was already, you know, this megastar. And he was starting to make the transition to icon status. Jay was like, yo, what's up, man? You got some beats? He was like, yeah, I got some beats. And he played him the beat tape. I'm like, that's hot, that's hot, that's hot. The music was so powerful for me. I was so inspired. And Jay started recording, like, right there on the spot. Kanye produced six joints on the Blueprint album. That was the bulk of the Blueprint right there. It's the Blueprint for the Blueprint. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the eighth wonder of the world. The Blueprint was like... The most critical claim out in 2001. Ace to the Izzo was the biggest song of that album. When that Ace to the Izzo joint hit and the six songs that he did on the Blueprint album, he, he really blew. H to the Izzo, B to the Izzo, that's the anthem, get your damn hands up. When you get the approval from Jay-Z, it's just like check, you know, on top of the world. You know, you got the best rapper alive saying you're dope. You're good from there. And the Blueprint was such a classic album. It definitely validated him on a lot of levels. At the time, like, hip-hop didn't have, like, that soul in it. And he gave, musically, hip-hop a certain soul that was missing. Everybody in the hip-hop industry were definitely looking towards Kanye and seeing what else he had in the stash. I was like, wow, this cat is, you know, he's serious. You know, whoever this dude is, he got some heat. So, you know, he was in demand then. Every major artist in urban music was requesting music from Kanye. But having production on the blueprint for Jay-Z was just part of Kanye's blueprint in terms of where he was trying to go as an artist. Yeah. He felt he had proven himself as a producer and that he could go as far as he wanted to. Kanye wanted to be a rapper. He always said, I make beats to rap. But nobody respected him as a rapper, so he had to go out there and get that respect. Kanye would take his demo around and say, I did the blueprint, but I'm a rapper. He going to these labels trying to get on. Every label, A to Z, Arista to Zombo. He would really be performing like he was on stage. Went in the L.A. Reid's office and jumped on the desk. We went to like five meetings where he jumped on tables. I was sitting there looking like, yo, my son is crazy. He's not just going to sell you a beat. He's going to sell you himself. We at war. Jesus Walker was on his original demo. God, show me the way because the devil's trying to break me down. Every a and was... You can't rap about Jesus. You can't have that, you know, in your song. Nobody wants to hear that. So here go my single doll radio needs this. They said you can rap about anything except for Jesus. It was too edgy. The industry is afraid of anything that breaks the conformity of how things flow. People heard Jesus walks, as is, and passed on signing him. Pass, blatantly pass. Gun, sex, lies, videotape. But if I talk about God, my record won't get played, huh? Yeah, I can't say we were eager to sign him. People had him in a box as just being a producer. I didn't pay attention to him rapping. You know, I didn't think that he was 
built to be a rapper. They was built to be a producer. We just wanted some hot beats at the time, be honest with you. They're like, stick to making beats. Don't nobody want to hear you rap. We just want your beats. Man, he got a lot of rejection slips. That was a wake-up call for him. But Kanye was determined to prove everyone wrong. We shine because they hate us. He's real passionate about being who he wanted to be and be becoming what he wanted to become. He would always say, people don't get it. They don't understand. They're they going to really regret it. Kanye wanted to be a rapper. Every second he got, he would play his demo. But nobody wanted to sign him. Nobody thought that he actually was going to make it. He just heard so much that all he was was a great producer and that he couldn't do anything else. The only person that really stepped to the plate was 3H. I was like a low-level A&R at Capitol. So he walks in, you know, had his total swagger already. I'm 19, I'm ambitious, I'll listen to anything at the time. 3H got it immediately. He was like, I love it, let's go. 3H said, well, let me take this over to my people at Capitol. I'm sure I can get it done. I played these songs in these A&R meetings over and over. My flex is better than yours. My tracks is better than yours. Capital was really excited about him. Kanye could sing, he could rap, he could make beats. He could do any style of record. We were ready to rock. Him and I really started having these great creative talks. He really felt someone saw what he saw and it was empowering Kanye as an artist. He was very excited. I remember him saying, I got a deal from Capitol on the table. I'm going to make it. I'm going to get signed. It's going to happen. But it didn't happen. In the 11th hour, the head of Urban A&R felt that the producer-rapper thing wasn't a sure shot. And ultimately, the deal got shut down. He was not going to be signed to Capitol. That was a rough day. Kanye was real disappointed. Talk about a knife in the heart, you know? But Dame Dash was really smart. When I added that capital reneged on the deal, I finally was like, all right, let's just do it. Well, he called me up and said, uh, AG, can we get this deal at Rockefeller? Like, yo, I'm signing him. You need to be over here anyway. He knew that Kanye was the best producer. And the bottom line was, he wasn't finna let all them good beats get away from Rockefeller. Kanye was signed to Rockefeller August 3rd, 2002. They signed Kanye, and within a few weeks of that, uh, Jay-Z was on tour. All the Rockefeller artists were, were on tour, and they were in Chicago. Right in front of Kanye's hometown, Jay stops the music. Uh-oh. Kanye! That's some big news for Shy, you want something? When I sign an artist, I give that artist a chain in front of the world. And what's up, you know, that I'm the newest member of the Rockefeller team. Dame just comes up and put the chain over his neck. And the crowd was going crazy. I want to show love to all my Chicago This was one of the happiest moments in Kanye's life. That was the seal of approval. When the chain was put on him, he transformed. He became not a producer who rapped, but a rapper who made beats. He was like, yes, I'm finally going to get the opportunity to express myself how I want to be expressed. After the deal was made Rockefeller, Kanye went full-fledged into making the album. Kanye threw everything he had, everything, his, his soul, his fiber, into this album. You want us to add Yeah. He was always working. Like I say, the first album is your whole life. But the label didn't seem to have any intent of pinning him out. Kanye didn't fit that mold of Rockefeller. They want you to fit inside this box. You're a gangster or are you a bling blinger? What are you? Him being from the suburbs, he doesn't think like the hood first. He thinks like the suburbs. He went against the grain. 
and made his own style of music. They really, really, really did not get it. Sometimes I sign artists, I don't put them out for years until they're ready. They may assign him as a rapper to keep him happy as a producer. Because I figured he'd make an album with his hot beats and we could use all my artists. Kanye wasn't getting, you know, the attention that he wanted. So he made the money elsewhere selling beats. He worked with Ludacris. Alicia Keys. Britney Spears. Kanye would show up a couple hours early and stay a couple hours late and work on his own album on their studio time. He did what he could do as far as just getting songs done. He's working 24-7. It was literally non-stop. One night, Kanye was in L.A. working with B.D. Siegel and was just working hard. He was uh, in a session real late. It was between 2 and 3 a.m., and it was on his way from the studio to the W, which is where he was staying in uh, Westwood. He was driving down Santa Monica. He fell asleep at the wheel. He was tired, man. Lost control, car swerved, he hit another car. And had a head over collision. The steering wheel hit him, like, in the jaw. Wow. Crack all this, man. And his jaw was broken in three places. If it would have hit him in the nose, he would have been dead. He was just barely conscious, and he just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They put him in the ambulance, and they took him to Cedar Sinai. And they was talking like he wasn't going to make it. We had a chance just to talk for a moment and to say a brief prayer before he went into surgery. He had several surgeries. His face was like way, way out here. When I walked into that hospital room, I wouldn't have even known my own son had he not said, Hi, Mom. His face was so swollen. The doctors, they wired his mouth shut. I was like, well, that's it as far as rapping. He was barely talking. I was just thinking to myself, damn, I hope, I hope he can still rap the same, you know, and deliver his lyrics the same way he used to. If he wouldn't have been able to rap again, I think he would have rather been dead. Kanye was in the hospital for a while, and his face was all messed up. He had to get his jaw rewired. The accident was like one of those life-changing events. The dream could have been over that night. Could have died, man. I think that the accident made Kanye appreciate life, but more so opportunity. He waited a day and got back to working. In his hospital bed, I mean, he was thinking of beats, thinking of raps, thinking of ways to be successful. So when he gets out of the hospital, he goes to check himself up in the W Hotel and had a studio in his hotel room. He was just working on music, having different artists come through knocking out joints. It was almost like his album was the nurse that came to visit him in his sick bed. The second he was able to speak, he recorded through the wire. Yo, Chief, they can't stop me from rapping, can they? Can they hop? Through the Wire is about the car accident. I spit it through the wire, man. Every line had, like, real-life experience of what he went through. And he was rapping through the damn wires. I gladly just get on right now. He literally rapped through the wire when his mouth was still wired shut. He couldn't even open his mouth fully. It was crazy. It sounded like it hurt when he rapped the <laughs> That's how it was to me. I'm like, damn, that's how you know how much this guy wants to be an artist. Once he knocked out through the wire, he was ready to go. He definitely felt like, I'm ready to drop this out. The label was not ready to move at the speed Kanye was moving. The label told him that'll never work, that'll never sell. They still didn't believe, and they weren't ready to jump behind the project. So he just took his own destiny in his own hands and did everything himself. There was just a big push from Kanye as well as everybody else around him. We became like a little baby label. Don C. and Kanye and John 
put together a mixtape. It was called Get Well Soon, and it had Through the Wire along with various different songs he'd actually produced. We would go to all the clubs. I would just roll up there with vinyl and a couple of hot girls and just have them go up to the DJ and play the record. Any opportunity that he had to perform places he would. Kanye actually would just go to different radio stations in different cities and just promote. Every station we could get on, every mix show, every local show, every cop station, we didn't care where it was. We kept pushing it, pushing the single. And Kanye took things a step further. Kanye put up 40 grand out of his pocket and we shot a video. Kanye was a successful producer, so he was able to have the paper to go ahead and fund his own video. And I think that's when everything changed. Yo, G, they can't stop me from rapping, Kenny. Kenny Hop. The video premiered at Jay Z's 4040 Club in New York City. My knock had, like, the streets buzzing, the whole street team out promoting this video premiere party. And I literally sat in front of the club with my two way. He went and invited, like, all this press down. Pretty much, you know, the industry at large were there. And all, like, the staff of Rockefeller. When I heard about it, I definitely had to show up. It was almost like it was against me. The energy in the room was incredible. Kanye went on one of his little tirades, like, yo, I paid for this myself. They won't do it's a great turnout. And it was all two thumbs up with the video. I drink a loose for breakfast, an intro for dessert. Somebody order pancakes, I just sip the scissor. Everybody was just like, wow. They was blown away by it. That right there could drive a same man bizarre. I was proud of him, you know, because it was something I would have did. And yeah, you know, at the time, no one was listening. So he did what he had to do. It definitely forced Rockefeller's hand. I think they all acknowledged that they had a real superstar. After that, it was like, oh, yeah, we need to do this video, need to be seen, and we need to push this album. One and two and three and four. And College Dropout was released February 10th, 2004. The album was incredible, man. College Dropout was just straight like dope. Oh, she's so excited. Oh, man, it was outrageous. It was outrageous. It was a groundbreaking, critically acclaimed album from the beginning. His first week of release. He was certified gold. After Through the Wire, the other songs that followed, just, it was like a domino effect. Slow Gems, you know, became an instant number one record. Boy, when that Jesus walk came. <sighs> Woo! You know what the Midwest is, young and restless. The following week, he was certified platinum. Then the album with multi-platinum. It was a beautiful time. It was Kanye West pandemonium. He instantly became the number one talked about thing in music. Not just hip-hop, but in music. Kanye was nominated for so many awards. He really wanted that approval from the people, man. He really wanted those trophies. But he lost a few um, awards, and he wasn't so happy about that. He felt snubbed at the American Music Awards. Gretchen Wilson got Best New Artist, and he thought he should. But I knew he was going to win Grammys. Kanye was nominated for 10 Grammys. He, he was the face of the Grammys. He was the Grammy boy. And the Grammy goes to the college dropout, Kanye West. Kanye won a Grammy for the best rap album of the year. Kanye West. The best R&B song of the year. Kanye West. And the best hip-hop song of the year. Jesus walks. Everybody wants to know what I would do if I didn't win. I guess we'll never know. I know he was overwhelmed. You know what I mean? He felt like he passed a certain part of the test. He felt vindicated because a lot of people said that he'd never do it. He proved them wrong. Kanye has sort of breathed new life in the hip hop for a whole new generation of people. Every time I rhyme. He's got a message in his music that is positive. Kanye has not only found himself as a rapper and a producer, he has found himself as an artist. I that I've arrived, it took more than a magazine to kill my vibe. He just proves to the world how much heart he had. His passion's not a gimmick, it's 100% why he is Kanye West. What drives Kanye West? Being told what he can't do. 
Just tell him, you can't do that. And watch him move. Holla at your boy! <laughs>